morning, Jeremy. Morning. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. Um, I want to talk to you about the, the, the future of the, the media business, the future of, of TV. Um, I live in the United States, and cord cutting is becoming a, a real issue with people getting rid of their pay TV subscriptions, going for over-the-top uh, alternatives. Here in Europe, it's a slightly different picture, and I, I wonder how whether cord cutting is an issue for, for Sky, whether you see much evidence of it, or, or what? What, what's, sure. what do you think? Uh, it isn't here. I think um, in Europe, generally, there are three or four really very different circumstances to the States. First of all, the US essentially is a market uh, that has moved to pretty much full penetration, uh, but selling the big bundle, essentially just selling one bundle. And I think as a consequence of that, too many people have actually ended up or has been forced to take a product that wasn't right for them. We haven't sold the big bundle in the UK for 10 years, actually. We, we've very much taken a view that we want to segment our market. Uh, the second reason is, um, I think, just the innovation and technology developments that we've seen in Europe with our over-the-top platform, but what we've done with a uh, sort of hybrid satellite platform is just well ahead of the viewing experience in the States. So I think the whole experience of television is just so much better here. Uh, and then thirdly, um, actually pricing in the States is a lot higher than in Europe on a constant purchasing basis, something like 60% more expensive uh, in, in Europe. So. Actually, in Europe, we've still got this great opportunity of growing penetration mm. and in really embracing technology and new technologies to unlock new pockets of demand and to right-size customers in terms of how they choose to consume content. So, so the, the, the drivers of, of cord cutting don't really exist then, or they're, they're, they're not really in Europe in the same, same Correct. way? You know, they're, they're, just, they're, just, they're just not here, and I just, think, just don't think they're going to emerge here right. uh, as they have in the States. Now, you mentioned Europe. I mean, you, you, Sky is now a, 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 a much different company. You have, yeah. s the, since the merger of Sky Italia, Sky Deutschland, What's that process been like, and what have you, what have you learned from that? Uh, well, overall, it's been great. I mean, the business is all performing uh, well. I think we've learned that um, the really important things are, are, are the same across each of those markets. So getting the best range of local and international content, um, having the, um, you know, essentially the, you know, the best viewing experience uh, across each of those markets, all of those things hold. Uh, and I think having established, if you like, a spine across Europe, that's going to allow us just to innovate and go quicker uh, across all of our markets than we could have done individually. Right. Could you see yourself taking the Sky brand into other European markets, into the US, for example? Or, or? Uh, well, certainly. I mean, for now, our focus is very much uh, in Europe. Um, so I think having uh, sort of bedded down the Sky is increasingly the question for us will be where we'll go to next. And I think either with our over-the-top platform uh, or um, potentially our other platform, there'll be other markets we want to go into. And then, you know, as I look at Sky relative to other providers across the world, I think, you know, we offer a pretty good service. So, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be open-minded over time as to sort of the things we could do. But what about competition? I mean, we, you know, again, the, the picture US to UK or US to Europe seems very different to me. And I, I wonder, you know, in the US, you have Pretty local monopolies, effectively, with pay TV companies who aren't really challenged or who don't have any competition. How different is it in Europe and in the UK? Well, I think I think the, com the competitive environment in Europe is is very vibrant. I mean, fundamentally, we compete against free. Uh, in, in every market in Europe, there's a strong free alternative. So, in the short term, that's a challenge. But actually, I think it's probably quite a good thing for the business because generally, we have to create services that people are willing to pay for. Right. Uh, and I think because of that, it means that we are constantly evolving and changing uh, and are stepping in, I think, to new trends uh, in, a, in a, much, uh, a much faster way than we would see in other markets, and I think particularly in the US. And you have your own over-the-top product, and you've segmented your bundle, haven't you? I mean, you're, you're offering smaller packages of... We do. Uh, yeah. So we have, a, in the UK, we call out service Now TV. Uh, it's, in effect, the skinny bundle. We've mm. created that there. Uh, and the important thing from our point of view is it allows us to target at very different uh, uh, customer groups, perhaps younger people, people who are living, you know, urbanites, people who are li living at uh, home, people who don't want to take an annual subscription, want to pay more as they go. Mm. Um, and uh, it's really helping continue to drive growth uh, and just open up new segments of the market that we just couldn't get to with the Sky brand. Right, right. 
So Sky very famously was, was built with, uh, well, one of the big drivers of its growth in the early days was live sports rights, exclusive sports rights. And over the last two decades, the, the cost of those rights, particularly Premier League football, have yeah. mushroomed, you know, no sign of slowing down. How, how sustainable do you think that is? I mean, we're 20 years in, so it must be pretty sure. sustainable. But when you look at the cost of the Premier League uh, pa package, um, can it keep going up forever? At what point does it, does it hit a ceiling? Well, I think, I mean, we're pretty fully bid, I think, now in the UK. I mean, it's not, certainly not cheap. It's very expensive to buy those rights. Um, the reason that we can make sense of it is we've just built um, a very, very big um, monetization engine in the UK. So we're distributing our sport not just over Sky, over other networks like the cable operators, the telcos. Uh, so we wholesale our rights to others. Um, we've uh, used our over-the-top service to sell sports on a daily basis as well as a monthly basis. Uh, we've become very sophisticated in our additional revenue streams that we generate. Um, so I think domestic football you know, will, will always be the single most important sports right in any market, but increasingly um, it's only part of what we offer uh, and we're really focused very much in, in, in growing broadly. It's very interesting, this quarter where we lost Champions League football in two of our markets, mm to competitors uh, and actually whilst you know, we wouldn't have we wanted to retain that but we decided it was too expensive mm. um, it really hasn't slowed the business down at all in fact we posted record growth and I think that's yeah. because of the breadth of what we offer now across our service what about original content and how you allocate resources to that is that is that becoming more of, a, of an appeal to people thinking about taking a, a side subscription versus perhaps live yeah. sport no, it's, I mean, it's very much the fourth big pillar of our content offering now. So um, we'll, we'll spend yearly about just under five billion on screen. Uh, we'll rapidly get our own commission content to be about a billion pounds of that. Um, and that's everything from, of course, traditional areas like our news channels, uh, but more importantly now investing in um, really high scale drama uh, across all of our markets, comedy, documentaries. And that's just going to become a bigger, bigger part of our story, yeah. which, of course, bringing the skies together uh, gives us the opportunity just to operate at uh, a greater scale. In fact, actually, today we've just um, launching our first um, a movie uh, in cinema in Italy based around uh, uh, Florence and the Uffizi. Right. Um, and that's actually gone directly into the box office, and then we'll come to the channel later after that. Right. What about other industry trends? In, in the United States, a lot of the content producers are going over the top. HBO has its own over the top service. I mean, this, this week they, they, uh, they added Jon Stewart to that. You know, they've they yes. really bolted that up. I, I wonder if that has any, any effect on you or will have any effect on you going forward in Europe, or whether, whether you'll see more of that here. I think we'll probably see more of it. Yeah. Um, I think often many of those trends we see coming across, but I think, again, in Europe, it's a bit different. First of all, because there's such a strong free alternative in Europe, um, uh, TV is very much a service that you have to sell and then keep sold. Yeah. Um, quite different to the States where essentially there's no uh, real free to air service, so people very much are buying their television. Uh, and then I think our job is just to make sure for our big partners that working with Sky uh, is gonna be better than them going directly. I'm sure they'll wanna have some element of that where they go direct to consumer. Disney's, Disney's about to go direct in, in the UK, isn't it? And Correct. Roll up. But, but, you, but you, you're their partner in in, in Across Europe, Europe yeah. yeah, and we've recently just extended our rights with Disney um, to do a, a, a broader deal, a greater set of rights. We'll get you know, their new content to Sky ahead of any other service, um, and then they'll monetize that you know, through the back end. Uh, but so, so, so it doesn't affect way. the chain, so th there is a window where you, you'll get frozen, for example, Correct. for a period of time before it moves to yes. their, their own service. That's right, yeah. and you know, I think over time you will start to see windows change a bit. Um, but, you know, I think um, you know, that first pay TV window, which is really about how you, you know, if you want to be the leader in all of your markets, is, is, is an expensive window uh, and one that you have to execute at scale is going to be where we'll, where we'll play. Right. Let me ask you about the future of Sky. Um, uh, Fox, 21st Century Fox owns 40%, 39% of the, of the company. Uh, James and Lachlan Murdoch uh, did, gave an interview recently where they, where they, they talked about the, the holding and what, what, they might, what might happen in the future. And they, and they talked about 
40% not being a sort of optimal position and suggested that either owning all of Sky or owning none of it would be preferable in, in the long term. Did, did that, how, how does that play into your thinking or, or does that, did that interview or did, did those comments change anything from your, your perspective? No, I, I, look, I think very much their position is um, the same as it's been for, for, for a while. I think they've said many times that they, to your point, they'd either prefer to be full owners or, or long term, um, you not have a minority stake. Um, but they're very happy, you know, with as, as happy owners. They understand the strategy. They can see the value creation opportunity that's ahead of us. So, and from Sky's point of view, it doesn't really change anything. You know, we just kind of stay focused and, and, and do our plan. And I think, you know, whatever the ownership structure of the company in the future, you know, I think we've just got a huge opportunity now ahead of us. Uh, and and we'll, just, we'll just do that. And then if we do a good job at that, um, you know, we're going to make all of our shareholders pretty right. happy. What about in the UK, the future going forward with your broadband and your IP TV uh, business, the, you, you don't own the network, you, you use the, the BT OpenReach network, yeah. um, as do other, other providers. And, and unlike in the US, where you have these fixed monopolies yes. using, using networks, in, in the UK it's a much more competitive. Do you, do you think that using that, 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 that way of doing things is sustainable? That, can you, can you envisage continuing to use BT OpenReach, or would you rather there'd be a, a, a change in the ownership of, of that network? Well, we would, I mean, BT OpenReach, of course, own the national infrastructure, right. so I don't think anybody's going to credibly, you know, overbuild all of that. Um, we would prefer to see OpenReach uh, run separately, uh, focused uh, on that network. Uh, BT, obviously, as a group, have chosen to move much more into retail again, and there are obvious conflicts uh, with that. You know, I think if we think of the broadband infrastructure that we need in this country, uh, or in the UK, I should say, you know, we would like to see fiber built to the home. I think all of the people here would like to do that because that's the way that we're going to have the most innovative set of services that we can develop and others can develop. And if we're relying on squeezing more and more out of that last mile of copper, mm. uh, that's going to be restrictive. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a pure play uh, infrastructure company that can focus on delivering that, uh, attract investment that can enable it to do that, uh, it's just going to be better for customers, uh, actually, frankly, better for the UK. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we'd, be, we'd be part of that. And I think OpenReach, unfortunately, is too restricted right. today as it sits in the overall BT group. The facts are it's not investing substantially anything more in its capex than it was 10 years ago. And it would be a big company would if they if they broke yeah. it off. Yeah, they'd it? be a FTSE 100 company, right. uh, a bit like something like National Grid. Uh, and I think you know, simpler, more transparent, more easily understood, with a singular focus of developing the sort of broadband infrastructure that we need for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Right. So th they've become a competitor, haven't they, in, in, in recent years? Mm -hmm. And again, the competitive landscape in the UK changes all the time. Um, how optimistic are you that, I mean, are you worried about the emergence of other competitors or did BT, I mean, BT, as you said, took the Champions yeah. League yeah. rights or, you know, outbid you guys for the Champions League rights. Are you, how healthy is the competitive market? I think it's, uh, look, it's, 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 it's as healthy today as, it, as, it, as it's always been. You know, we've always faced big competition. Mm. You know, the commercial free to air sector when we started was huge. We've seen others uh, come in, the cable operators, uh, you know, good operators around Europe. Yeah. Uh, the big telcos, uh, you know, obviously big. Um, but the important thing for us is just that we keep changing. You know, mm. we keep executing our plan. We keep stepping into new trends in the marketplace. Um, we never lose our appetite for change. I mean, Sky actually is the ultimate over-the-top business. You right. know, we don't, we've never owned the satellite. We've always gone over infrastructure. And our focus is really on our skills in creating and aggregating content, innovation, and brilliant customer management. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we do those things uh, well, and I think we will, then the opportunity ahead of us uh, is huge. Bear right. in mind, in, in the markets that we compete in today, there are still 65 million homes who are not yet paying for TV. Right. And if we can persuade a relatively small proportion of those uh, to convert over the next few years, and our envelope for growth is very large indeed, I think. What about advertising? I mean, the, the, there's a lot going on in that space, particularly digital advertising and ad blockers and all of that. But the t TV advertising, which I think a lot of people were concerned about, seems to be going through a bit of a renaissance and the ability to target 
specifically individual households, individual demographics. What, what are you guys doing in, in that yeah, space? Yeah, so our, our TV advertising service, which we call AdSmart, um, essentially allows us to uh, serve different adverts into the broadcast stream uh, according to a demographic profile of, of houses. We would go down to, we could go to groups as little as 5,000 houses. Uh, we have something like 500 ads stored in the box at any one time and we can splice different ads according to different profiles. So, so you could get to a point with one house is watching the same program on Sky, the next, the neighbor is watching the same program and they're getting, both getting served different Correct, but different we ads. do that today. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that's enabling us to um, pull a whole set of new advertisers into our business, something like 70% of, uh, of, of uh, the, cu the customers who are taking that service are entirely new to advertising. Uh, and to get significant premiums on the back of that. So we're taking a lot of the learnings that we've seen uh, online and starting to execute those now uh, in, into TV. And then the next phase of that will be to connect that over multiple platforms. So we can target not just to your TV, but to your mobile phone over the internet and give you a very, very different uh, service than you've ever experienced before. And I suppose it opens it up to different types of advertiser as well who might not yeah. usually go for the big broad brush or scattergun ad buy, they, you know, if they're going to be targeted at smaller groups, does that, does that, correct? it's an opportunity. So, yeah, so take something like, say, financial services, uh, who probably want to get to highly affluent, uh, older generation, uh, regional uh, demographic, we can deliver that to them today. They'll never make sense of a national campaign, uh, but they could make sense of a local campaign. And so we can bring them into the TV advertising world, whereas in the past they probably relied more on press uh, to communicate. Right. I know you had Rupert Murdoch um, in, in the offices lately. How, what's his, his take on, on new innovation like targeted advertising? I mean, is he, he's still bullish about very, the future. Yeah, yeah, very bullish. I think very excited about some of the things that we're doing. Um, you know, is, uh, he himself is the ultimate proponent of change and renewal. So uh, his, um, I think he's very up about the future for Fox and, and Sky is, is, is obviously a big investor in Sky. Yeah. Um, so he only ever says go faster, go further. So. Right. Terrific. Well, the red light is flashing, so we'll call into it there. But Jeremy, thanks so much for being here. A round of applause for Jeremy, everyone. Great. Thanks. Perfect. Thank